All right, good morning, everyone. Nice to um, see everyone still going strong on this final morning. Uh, I'm Dan kritz -Phelan. I'm the editor of Foreign Affairs Magazine. It is my immense pleasure to be on stage with these four speakers. Um, I confess that the term co was new to me before I got this assignment, and I spent probably too much time going down a rabbit hole trying to understand the game theory behind it and, and failing to. But um, I don't think you really need to understand the theory to understand that this concept, I think, really goes to the heart of what I see as the central tension in, America, in, in foreign policy and geopolitics, international relations today. In some ways, it's the steepest challenge that policymakers and leaders face. And it also goes to the question that has um, the theme that has defined these entire four days, which is trust. And it's really how do you preserve trust in certain areas in a world that is fund fundamentally competitive. You know, we're not gonna under, under, um, uh, overcome some of those competitive dynamics, so how do you uh, still preserve space for progress on shared challenges, addressing threats, uh, continuing to drive progress and innovation, uh, even without um, uh, wishing away or ignoring the fact that you do have those uh, competitive dynamics in a world that will continue to get more complicated geopolitically. Um, I will very briefly introduce our speakers as I go to each of them. Um, but since the conceit of this topic is in some ways that policymakers should learn from those in the private sector, I'm gonna start with the private sector, then we'll go to our, our couple of public sector leaders, and then, uh, and then, and then close with the private sector again. Um, I'm gonna start with Tak Ninami, the CEO of um, Centauri Holdings in Japan. Um, Tak, you know, Japan is in some ways in a, a fascinating position because um, it is in a, a complicated neighborhood these days. Um, but has managed to preserve uh, very strong investment presence, business presence, even among uh, in countries where it has complicated relationships, China being the first of those. As you reflect on your own experience uh, trying to build, build uh, your business, trying to preserve your presence even in those markets, what do you see as the key lessons? How have you thought about China especially? Okay, for business, uh, I'd like to raise three points. One, three is stability. And, uh, Let's uh, take an example of the anti-espionage law. And as uh, so you know, the uh, more than five people were arrested last year. And we don't know why. So rules should be clear for us to uh, develop our business. So first, second, upgrade the intelligence activity, even that we are in private sector. For example, Santori developed the, uh, its uh, uh, in intelligence uh, uh, capability by establishing a London office, uh, Washington DC, New York, by putting the resources to contact with the, you know, uh, lots of uh, think tanks and experts. Second, and third, we have to be prepared for you know, scenarios. And we have to think about the, what kind of scenarios we can think about, such as uh, Taiwan uh, contingency. So we Suntory started to simulate what actions are needed working with the government, such as the evacuation of our employees from Taiwan. It would be very tough. So, but uh, we have to work with the, with the government and uh, some other peers. And uh, for the country, uh, we are urging Japan, I mean the government, first of all, strategic indis indispensability. What is it? Semiconductors, maybe it's ingredients. We have to have, we have to identify together with the government. Second, I would like to say dialogue. Um, private sector should not give up and uh, talk to the, uh, uh, our counterparts in China, even though they are SOEs. So that is so important. And uh, uh, thirdly, I'd like to mention about not only China, but the, in terms of the uh, stabilizing the uh, 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 order of the East Asia, we shook hands with South Korea. So important, and working with the President Biden, Basically, we have, we have a very complicated uh, history, but uh, we are trying to overcome because we need to stabilize the uh, uh, East, East Asia. So that is a core uh, petition because, uh, I mean, Korea was a fierce competitor for us and for them, but we have to work together to maintain the order of the East Asia. So we learned a lot, and but they're still underway. Mm -hmm. And as you look at the growing tensions in the region, are there contingencies you're particularly focused on beyond Taiwan? Is, is Taiwan really at the, the heart of your concerns right now? 
Yes, it is. And uh, I understand that the uh, top meetings in uh, San Francisco made a big sense and a huge less attention in the East Asia, like a far less number of the uh, uh, scrambles by the Japanese uh, fire jets. That works, but I believe that's uh, truth. So preparedness is so important for, for the private sector and the government. Um, so preparation is uh, the big, big the deterrence capability. So even the private sector has to work with the government in terms of deterrence. And, and let me ask you one more question about how you see the U.S.-China relationship. Japan, again, is in such an interesting position here because in many ways, I think Japan was really at the forefront of trying to alert American policymakers from the challenge from China when that was not uh, at the top of uh, the American list of priorities. But at the same time, Japan has urged uh, a more, um, uh, in some ways, on the economic front, more engagement from the United States, not pulling back, both with China and in the region. So do you see, uh, are there things that you would like the United States to do? How, do you, how do you see that competition developing, and what does that mean for your businesses and other, and other businesses in the region? Well, both are so important. In terms of investment, United States, trade with China. So how to manage uh, the uh, um, question? What would you do? Um, we are stuck in the middle. But uh, I'd like to uh, ask the, uh, all the business leaders and the political leaders to, to advance, uh, for example, CPTPP. That is a vital weapon for us to keep the uh, business uh, uh, going uh, forward. And by the way, it's surprising that uh, China applied the, the CPTPP. So I'd like to ask uh, US friends to reconsider to join the CPTPP or TPP. Uh, personally speaking, it's a big mistake that the uh, US walked away from the TPP. But in the meantime, Japan should play a key role to expand the CPTPP uh, membership. But uh, what to do with China? But uh, CPTPP should have the uh, policy of inclusion and uh, um, neutra neutrality. So Japan and other you know, uh, member countries should uh, negotiate with China, but, and we evaluate how ready they are. But to your mind, it would be a good thing if China joined CPTPP at this well, point? Well, at least uh, they showed their posture. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if uh, they can uh, go up to the uh, high level of the, the CPTPP rules. That is a very good segue to Jane Harmon. Um, Jane was a, very, a longtime member of Congress from California, ranking member on the House Intelligence Committee and a, a leader, uh, leading foreign policy voice in the Democratic Party, and then became president of, of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Jane, let me go slightly out of order and, and get you to pick up that trade question. Trade, politics, the United States have changed dramatically since you were, you were first in Congress, certainly. Both parties have turned against TPP, which the Obama administration led in, in negotiating before it was uh, abandoned by both, both Trump and Biden. Uh, what has happened with trade politics, and do you ever see them coming back around to creating the space for something like CPTPP? Well, let me answer that in one second after I tell you my insight into the term uh, coopetition. Uh, I think it's a great word because mm -hmm. it, it combines uh, cooperate and compete. It also is uh, two-dimensional. I mean, it's, it's both sides uh, engaging in coopetition. Uh, and I, I just wanted to say that the, the, the last framing that I've always used was uh, from Joe Nye, who I think is an absolutely wonderful man and respect and admire. However, soft power, hard power is harder to, to, to think about because it's two separate things and it's one-sided. So I, I just, whoever invented this term, I think was... Uh, 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 very, very insightful. And, and second word, I, 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 I'm not sure we should restore trust. I don't think we can. I think we need to manage distrust. And if we think about it that way, uh, we're more flexible, and I think we have to be very flexible. On the issue of trade, I find it heartbreaking. Uh, I describe myself as a uh, pro-defense, pro-business, pro-trade, progressive Democrat. And there are only five of us left, and we should be embalmed in a museum. Um, you know, my party has left me on trade. The Republican Party has left 
the moderates on trade. In fact, the moderates have left both parties, and that's part of the problem. The anti-trade uh, wing of both parties is now stopping progress, and even IPEF, which was, I thought, a, an attempt to make up for the U.S. pullout from TPP. This is the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, right? Yes. Uh, even IPEF now, sadly, which was going to be uh, 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 highlighted at the San Francisco summit, um, I think, no, that was at the, I forget where, where, where Biden was going to push IPEF, but at the last minute, he had, they had to pull the teeth out of it because some members, Democratic members in tough re-elections, uh, didn't want the U.S. to do it. So we, we do not have a pro-trade majority in the U.S. I think that is extremely short-sighted. I totally agree uh, with the comments here. And because we pulled out of TPP, we created a vacuum which China is filling. And I think the crucial loss for the U.S., I'm, I'm for, uh, are joining other organizations. But who sets the rules? Uh, TPP was designed for the West to set the rules. And the notion that there are strong economies in the Indo-Pacific, even if they're large trading partners with China, but strong economies in the Indo-Pacific is the best buffer against Chinese aggression. <coughs> So let me, let me stick with the topic of domestic politics, just given your deep experience on this. When Do you it comes want to depress to... everybody? I mean, why? <laughs> no. It's early. I'm, 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 I'm not sure what else we can do with this topic, but um, we'll, we'll try to end on, on an optimistic note. Um, the politics of, of the China relationship have also become uh, incredibly difficult in Congress. When you think about the term coopetition, when it comes to the US-China relationship, you would imagine cooperation on climate change and public health, um, e even those areas where the shared interest seems very clear, you don't see a lot of space for cooperation. Some of that is about the politics in, in, US, in the US Congress. I noted when the Biden administration started to do more proactive outreach to the Chinese government last year, uh, Nick Burns, our ambassador there, was accused of impeachment by, by members of Congress. So when you look at the politics of this, how do you create the space for that kind of cooperation, given what members of Congress seem to see as the political imperatives of being tougher on China than everyone else? Well, just in my political lifetime, which is a long time, uh, this whole relationship has evolved. In the 90s, many of us voted for most favored nation status for China. I'm from California, China is a huge trading partner, and that was a safe vote to make. Now I think I couldn't even come up. Nobody would go touch that. We all thought then uh, we wanted to admit China to the WTO. We thought that China wanted to be us. Well, oops, we got distracted after 9-11, and then we discovered China's rise, and China doesn't want to be us, and now we're trying to manage uh, a distrust in a very different relationship. So. Uh, what's going on with, with China in Congress? Um, as I've told you, Daniel, uh, I'll explain this. China is cheap retail, meaning if you're a politician in either party, bashing China gets you a lot of attention. That's a <laughs> good thing. And the rhetoric follows that. The rhetoric is harsh and, and really extremely unfortunate. Do the people saying that really, really mean that? Well, some of them do. I mean, the level of information on China in Congress is like everything else in Congress these days is pretty minimal. And uh, sound bites matter more and clicks matter more than at working to solve problems because blaming the other side is more potent than working with the other side. That makes you bipartisan. That's bad, just so you know. But uh, on this, uh, I think that many, some in Congress do get it, that it's a multi-dimensional relationship. And I commend the Biden administration for getting it. They're really trying. Uh, to operate, I think, on three fronts, uh, uh, co confrontation, competition, and cooperation. And different issues fall in different buckets. But the visits by everybody to Beijing and so on are great. And let me just close by this. Nick, Nick Burns is one of our most talented uh, public servants. Uh, he's an amazing guy uh, who has taken on the toughest assignments. I don't know how he is surviving in Beijing, getting bashed by <laughs> members of Congress, and, and uh, being shut out of some of the meetings. But we have put our best forward. And I just hope that in the last year of the Biden administration, uh, we don't mess it up. Let, let me ask you one more quick question, just in, in hopes of ending uh, this segment on an optimistic note, so you don't accuse me of uh, sen sending you into the weekend depressed. You know, I think there's another dynamic at play, um, certainly in the United States, and I think you see this elsewhere, which is 
even in a context of competition, th there can be a race to the top dynamic. We can see this on um, certain of the investments that the U.S. is making in basic research and science. So can you get um, what is essentially cooperation, if, even if we don't call it that? It's really you know, various actors in, uh, as a way of competing, committing to doing more on some of these shared challenges. Do you see that as a possible way to think about this that doesn't require cooperation of the kind that seems very hard to achieve politically? Yes. I mean, I think uh, everything doesn't have to be in the press, with all apologies to your foreign affairs daily thing, which I learned about yesterday, which is wonderful. Congratulations, Daniel. But everything doesn't need to be in the press. And I think underneath this are, are major signs of cooperation, especially in the medical area. And uh, space is another place where, in defense terms, no, but in commercial terms, uh, we need one, uh, certainly according to me, we can't decouple our whole space systems. That's insane. Uh, but I think, I think there are signs of progress. And I, I think, listening to people who know a lot more than I do, uh, that, that China gets it and maybe will hold back this year. I'll just make one last comment. After the Iowa primaries the other night, I think some major leaders, and I don't know that she is in this group, but two who are in this group, Putin and Netanyahu are trying to wait out the Biden term. I think they think Trump is going to win. I don't. I think it's way too early to know that. Uh, it, it, but at any rate, they think Trump is going to win, and they think life will be easier for them when he does. And I think, what do I, what do I think about that? This is the time for Biden to be more forward-leaning and push on the policies that are right, a two-state, you know, the, the pathway to a two-state solution, uh, and uh, more aid for Ukraine now, and on China. Uh, more uh, coopetition. Um, there's a lot to unpack there, but let me move on to uh, the other member of the panel from, from the pu public sector. This is uh, to, immediately, immediately to my left, Mara Shevkovich from the European Commission, uh, Executive Vice, Vice President for the European Green Deal, and a longtime diplomat. Um, Maris, you are in a, a fascinating position because you are trying to make progress on what is perhaps the biggest uh, or most urgent shared challenge of all, one of the, the um, I think, questions that really goes to the heart of this topic, um, but also come from a, a world where you're, you're keenly aware of competition and geopolitics and <coughs> cannot wish them away. As you have entered this, this job, how have you tried to balance those two awareness of the geopolitics with the need to make progress on climate change? No, thank you very much uh, also for setting the themes uh, and the topic so interesting. When I saw the first time the word competition, I thought it's a spelling mistake, but I agree with the <laughs> Madam Senator that actually it's a very, very good term. Because can, can, can we do a quick poll? <laughs> Who in this room knew the term before seeing this panel? Okay, so, oh, I, so, it's, so it's, yeah. it's, our, it's our ignorance it's, it's up our, here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a different spell check yeah, yeah, exactly, system in exactly. our computers. No, but uh, uh, I, I think it's, it's really, it's, uh, it's excellent term because when I was thinking about it, this is how to foster, you know, cooperation in the times of, of, of huge competition. And this is what we are discussing here today. And, and for Europe, I have to say that, um, I mean, uh, we are going through the kind of uh, painful uh, acceptance of the fact that uh, we are living in uh, the tough uh, geopolitical world where everything can be weaponized. Data, critical raw materials, uh, uh, technologies, even, even medicines. And, and you know, we've been uh, traditionally uh, the, the institution, the union, which was always championing free and fair trade, rules-based system, compatibility with the uh, WTO, yeah. and uh, we've been promoters of the, of the global trade. I can tell you that in that club we are feeling more and more lonely. So what, what, what you have to do in this case, you have to consider how to deal, I would say, with this, uh, with this new situation. And in many aspects, I also agree with Jane, that it's heartbreaking to see that, I mean, the, we, we had a very well-established system, but now because of this geopolitical uh, rivalry, everything gets very, very difficult. We are somehow closing in. And when I'm talking to my, uh, to my American friends, I think we are now uh, in, in, in a stage of the, of, the, of the world development when we should focus how to build more transatlantic bridges and less obstacles. Mm -hmm. And if we cannot go for the big uh, 
uh, free trade agreements because always something comes in and we know how especially the debate on agriculture is, is very difficult and we had our, our dose of, of uh, hormone beef and chlorine chicken deb uh, debate. Uh, so I know that it's very difficult. So what I think we could consider, that's maybe one, one, one idea, which is my private uh, idea which I share with some of my friends. Let's, uh, let's go for some kind of a narrower type uh, uh, of the agreement. One idea which I like a lot uh, is uh, creation of the transatlantic clean tech market. And of course, we can do the same with the mm -hmm. uh, like-minded our Asian mm -hmm. partners because this is where the competition is taken. This is where the uh, economic future will be decided. Shouldn't we cooperate more on having the most uh, performing solar panels, uh, hydrolyzers, uh, batteries, and so on and so forth, instead of uh, having this uh, subsidy war, but from one side we, we, uh, we are considering what kind of uh, trade defense mechanism we might need uh, uh, to use because we see the flood of cheap uh, uh, EVs which are heavily subsidized coming to Europe from China. Mm -hmm. And, and from, from other side, uh, we had to introduce new term in our state aid uh, policy, which we, until this period, been using extremely, extremely carefully as a matching aid uh, to make sure that the companies who got very lucrative offer of the huge state subsidies will stay in Europe and, and not uh, to go to to US, shouldn't they kind of use, I would say, this, uh, this public money to promote research, innovation, and all the, all the I would say, technological development and creating business case, I would say, for the, for the Green Deal technologies. I think this is what such a close friends and allies uh, should do, but we are living in, um, I would say, in this new world, and uh, therefore everybody is, is adjusting to the system. My, my, my worry only is that if this persists for a long time, uh, that what would be left uh, from the system which was working pretty well and which will not be that easy to restore. So I agree with, uh, uh, with Jane that uh, we are not kind of uh, rebuilding the, the trust before we get there. We are kind of managing the situation and it's, and it's not easy. And it seems striking to me that even when you look at the US-European relationship, which is pretty good when it comes to uh, uh, global relationships between powers these days, the green transition, green energy, has become, I think, a source of strife as much as of cooperation. The European reaction to the Inflation Reduction Act and subsidies and Buy American provisions and the United States was met with consternation and you know similar responses on the European side. That seems quite concerning when it comes to the global picture to me. I think that uh, uh, when I when I was uh, in the uh, United States after the uh, IRA was, was adopted, uh, uh, from um, there, there been, I would say that such a two parts of our action. From the first part was very positive because I think it was very clear sign that uh, U.S. under this administration decided to go decisively on the, on, on the green path, and of course that was welcome because there there was always a bit of a hesitation. And I uh, was coming to the US very proudly, sharing my experience how to build the European Battery Alliance. And I see that my American friends have been listening to me very carefully <laughs> because they introduced many of these aspects into the, into the uh, uh, IRA <coughs> Act. What was surprising for me at that time, to be honest, was that when I was telling them that, look, uh, I mean, uh, this is putting the European companies at a huge disadvantage, that they've been genuinely surprised. Genuinely surprised. And I think that. Uh, uh, if you are talking about the, the program, which might lead, as some uh, economists said here in Davos, um, into the subsidies, which should be on top of the one, one trillion dollars. This is I would say, massive programs, which has, I would say, global, global repercussions. And I think that it would be uh, very useful to use all our bodies, which we created, be the Trade and Technology Council, and all, all other bodies, just to talk to your closest partners and, and, and allies, how can we kind of synergize, how can we use it uh, um, uh, for the good development on both sides of the Atlantic and also for our partners, uh, partners uh, in Asia because uh, we see that all our democracies are under pressure. Uh, all of us, we, we have to find uh, the solutions to autocratic regimes where transparency or the level of subsidies, it's really not a problem and they can really use it at the, at the whim. Uh, but it didn't, it didn't happen. So therefore now we have very intense uh, dialogue with our American partners. We are looking for the ways uh, uh, how, to, how to overcome this and therefore I'm coming with these proposals. Let's build bridges. Let's look what, uh, how we can synergize. Because if we create the, the European, American, Japan, South Korean market for the green tech or green tech, clearly it would stand the global standards. It would bring the economy to the scales which would be enormous. 
it would be fantastic not only for our economies, but we can we can share it uh, with the developing world. I mean, all of us been in COP, I presume, and you saw what kind of thirst there is in uh, Africa and Latin American countries for for photovoltaic panels, for uh, digital substations, for you know electrifying this industry. They they want to leap over our uh, industry of fossil age, but we need to scale up in a way that we can actually share these technologies with these countries as well. And let me ask you one quick final question and, and ask you to put on your, your diplomat hat in this case. There's a reading of the US and Euro exper European experience with Vladimir Putin's Russia that says, it was hopeless to ever try to cooperate to create space for cooperation when he was going in this direction that led you know, to the war in Ukraine. Uh, even arms control is seen as uh, a useless form of cooperation despite the shared interests by some. As you reflect on the, the lessons of the European approach to, to Russia, what do you see as the right takeaways from that? I think that uh, uh, we've been probably a little bit naive. Uh, uh, maybe we had the same belief as the uh, US had about the China, that okay. gradually with the increased cooperation and trade and these uh, interlinkages, I would say, on the, on the economic scale, the, the Russia will be embracing more and more, I would say, the characteristics of the, of the, of the Western, Western democracies. And because we are such a big trading partner, there was a lot of uh, uh, I would say dependencies build. I mean, and now we are paying enormously uh, high price also in cash terms for being so dependent on uh, Russian uh, fossil supplies. Uh, obviously, it was it was it was a mistake. Russia is a big country. The war in Ukraine is is, is terrible, and I think they have to support uh, uh, Ukrainians to to defend uh, their country. We don't know how long it will last. Uh, let's hope that the peace will be rather sooner than later. Uh, but then we would have again to, to coexist, uh, to coexist with, with such a big country like Russia. But I, I think it will take another political generation uh, in Europe, in Russia, so we can be, let's say, on the, on the normal speaking terms. And a lot of things would have to happen by, uh, by then. And I think that uh, we will not repeat the mistake not to be uh, really vigilant in what kind of uh, dependencies you can be involved. To. Therefore, what we are doing right now with the critical raw materials, with the global supply chains, with uh, a lot of other sensitive products, we go for diversification, we are looking at strategic autonomy, we are looking at common purchase of these <coughs> products on a European scale, and, and what can we also uh, manufacture in Europe, and what can we stockpile in Europe. So we would uh, kind of limit uh, uh, those dramas as we had to go through, be it in COVID-19 or then uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the situations once we suddenly had to find the total alternative to Russian fuel supplies. Um, next, and I, I should say I will leave time for a few questions from uh, the audience at the end, but let me go um, uh, last but not least to uh, Matthias Midreich, the CEO of Umicor in Belgium. Um, and Matthias, let me try to um, uh, turn this around a bit, um, and, and again in a, the hope of achieving um, some kind of optimism here, finding some kind of optimism here. Um, you are, of course, keenly aware of the geopolitical dynamics. There's uncertainty about elections this year. Uh, Donald Trump could come back in the United States. You could see changes in, in, in Europe and in other parts of the world that could affect the international effort on the whole set of issues that you're focused on, in, in, um, just as, uh, as Maros is in the public sector. As you look at that set of threats, that turbulence, is that a kind of critical threat to your ability to do business, or do, are there ways for you to kind of go forward with your key priorities even amid that turbulence? Yeah, so uh, although I, I'm uh, looking forward to put a more positive feedback maybe here, let me first start with what are the negatives on that, what's clearly... I, I was really hoping we could have to... Yeah, I, I come to that. Yeah. Yeah. Give me a second. So first of all, it's clear. So if we have this kind of uh, fragmented world for, for the business side, and we are representing uh, the clean tech side of it, uh, the energy transition, we are in the middle of this. First of all, it's not good because you are, in principle, decreasing your return on capital if you have to operate in specific regions differently. You have to fill, if you cannot trust your global supply chain, you have to fill it with goods. You need capital for that. You don't get any returns on that. You have to uh, invest in factories in different regions uh, rather than uh, you know, optimizing a, a global setup. So that's negative. And as Maros also said, for innovation, it's not good. If you do not have a global competition, or at least a larger competition, where you can exchange on good practices and challenge the different companies, 
it's decreasing. Uh, however, and now I come to the positive point, I, I think that there are also some positive elements for companies who are able to play in this new environment. First of all, uh, and I, I shouldn't say that like this, but it is a fact, it's reducing competition, competi com yeah. competitive threat. If you look to the IRA, and we are active in the field of, of battery materials, for example, we, from one day to the other, all of the Chinese competition has been eliminated from that market. So for the companies that uh, know how to play in several regions, uh, it's good for them because they have a better chance to get market share and competition is shut out. Secondly, um, uh, it's also good to receive public funding because the regions that want to be independent and want to strengthen their geopolitical uh, uh, you know, resilience, they give money to companies to invest. So the IRA is one example, uh, Europe to a certain extent as well. Uh, China for sure, so if you play it well as a company, you can compensate the lack of uh, efficient capital de de deployment by public funding. And let me like, uh, make the, the last comment, which I think is the strongest one, and I don't hear it at all in the debate. I think fragmented world is better for the environment. Because if you don't have global supply chains where you ship millions of tons of materials, but you have to focus on local supply chains, uh, you will save a lot of CO2 in the equation. And I think that's ultimately, uh, if you want to be on a positive note, that's exactly what it will bring for the planet. It helps to reduce CO2. I want to I follow up on uh, one thing you alluded to, which is kind of ingredients of clean tech in the supply chains. I think back often to an essay we ran in Foreign Affairs a couple of years ago by Jason Bordoff and Megan O'Sullivan called Green Upheaval, which is about all the ways in which the, the clean energy transition will uh, drive competition and turbulence in geopolitics rather than bringing people together around, around these shared challenges. And you know, you know the list of, of, of what that could mean. It's critical minerals, it's, um, you know, we talked about EVs uh, flooding into, into Europe. Um, when you look at the, the ingredients of clean energy, do you see that, do you see ways to reduce, reduce competition, reduce that as a source of, of instability in geopolitics? And for sure, and we often have to say, this is, uh, I like the word a lot, uh, co-opetition, but it's not new in the industry, right? If you look to uh, one of the key industries in that the metal mining and, and processing industry, uh, at the same time, uh, companies are your customer, your supplier, and your competitor. It depends on where, uh, where the critical minerals are coming from, where they are processed, who is doing what with it. Also, the automotive industry is very well used since decades for this, you know, sharing uh, engine platforms in the past. Now, in the electric vehicle age, battery technologies are shared between competitors. Uh, so it's a concept that is not new. And now what we see in the, uh, in the energy transition uh, frame, there are even new coalitions forming. You see uh, car manufacturers that go into uh, battery manufacturing themselves. There are joint ventures formed all over the world across these different stages of the supply chain. So I think that um, in principle, the industry concern is well prepared for that. Now, on the same note, uh, uh, how could this even be better or what needs to be done to even foster that? Uh, I think there are two points. The first one is, um, again, I come back to CO2. If uh, the global legislators are pushing more on CO2 of electric vehicles uh, being mandated or, or you know, rewarded in a certain way, I'm, when I say about CO2, I mean the, the scope three that is encompassing all the CO2 that is used while building an electric vehicle. If this, and Europe is really in a leading position for that from my point of view, the US not, so they should, <laughs> should come up. I'm because, shocked, I'm yeah, shocked. I'm sure you are. So, uh, because think about if, you have, if there's a global kind of non-negotiable uh, standard that there should be no CO2 in an electric vehicle, uh, it has to uh, result in cooperation because only by working together between the different steps of the supply chain, you will be able to achieve that. You cannot do it alone. You, are, you have to always work with the ones going forward. That's number one. Uh, and number two, from my point of view, the, the public reward, the grant system, the, the subsidies that we see all over the world, they should change and not be awarded to single companies, but I think they should reward ecosystems. They should reward, uh, you know, uh, a couple of companies working together across the supply chain and make this as, as a mandatory, um, uh, you know, um, threshold to get those those things. So I think, 
in a nutshell, I think the, uh, there is a threat for the industry, specifically in the uh, energy transition side. I think it's not a new threat and the industry is quite well prepared in some sense to make it, but we can do it better with the things I just mentioned. Can I, can I just make one tiny comment on that? Because it occurs to me that governments and industry are moving in opposite directions. Macron was here and he was talking about sovereignty. Right. Um, um, Trump talks about America first and, and the rise of population, uh, populism and isolationism, at least at the government level, is increasing, not sadly. Uh, and I'm sure we all agree on that. Um, but industry is figuring out that certainly for the green revolution, there has to be cooperation. And I, you know, I don't know how these trends get reconciled. Let, let, let me ask both both um, uh, Taka and Matthias to maybe give 30 seconds of advice to uh, to, to governments, to, to policymakers in the public <laughs> sector when it comes to this question of how you maintain. Um, some cooperation, you have diversified suppliers, you're you know, working with competitors without becoming so over-reliant on one market, one source of materials that uh, it becomes a threat to you. How, do you. how do you kind of balance those two imperatives? You go first. Well, I think uh, uh, such as uh, the, uh, uh, we'd like to talk to the government t in terms of the, what to do with your carbon pricing, for example. You're talking about uh, in this area, I mean, uh, not to ship out to other, you know, far away. So what to do with the, uh, the rule making? I think it's uh, still uncertain. So that should be materialized sooner or later so that, that we can talk about it with the predictivity. I mean, predictable, that's, that's so important. So the government and we, private sector, should work together about the uh, rule making. And $80, $100, then yeah. we can change our right. interaction. I would even say to strengthen the methods, I fully agree, and it's my same point. Predictability on those uh, things that drive and that make uh, help us to invest and have a certainty that the investments are good and not change in regulation right. will make them obsolete. I think that's uh, the basic of, uh, of going forward. Great. Let me go to the audience for a couple questions. Please um, stand and make your questions uh, short and crisp so we can get a couple in. I'll start in the front row. Uh, there's a microphone coming. Yes, thank you. I'm from Mexico. You talk a lot about China all the time, and uh, I will, there are a lot of elections going worldwide. I would like to hear the comments. What's the relations? Uh, what's your opinion about elections coming in Mexico? Thank you. Jane, do you want to uh, take that one? Uh, OK, <laughs> uh, sure. Uh, I think that uh, Mexico and the US are and have to be uh, closely lashed together. However, there has been a difference in government policy fairly recently. Uh, one of the initiatives of Trump that I, I strongly support was the USMCA, the US-Mexico, um, Canada agreement. And we recognize that with, with respect to trade, for one thing, we, we can't exist without Mexico. So what do I think about the elections? Uh, I guess I, I can't, maybe others know more than I do. I don't know how, <laughs> AMLO is a, an unusual politician and he has this combination of personal appeal and then his policies seem to be more uh, different from what I would have expected. So I, 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 don't, I don't know how to predict it. I, I would just add on Mexico, it's hard to imagine a country that is better positioned to take advantages from some of the global yeah. dynamics that might seem exactly. uh, challenging to exactly. others. Um, and, and, and that to me, uh, I, I think there are various ways that under, even under AMLO, the, the government has done that, but that seems to me like the, the key question. Mm -hmm. Talk, did you want to add anything on that? Well, definitely. I think uh, we have production operation in uh, states, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, we'd like to go to the Mexico furthermore. So I don't anticipate any big change in Mexico, and uh, we have a big plan to mm -hmm. Uh, invest to mix for furthermore. So uh, we can't on you. <laughs> uh, let, let me go to the second row here. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm professor of economics at the Seoul National University, South Korea. Uh, my question goes to uh, Chairman Dinami. Dinami. Uh, thank you so much for emphasizing the importance of cooperation between South Korea and Ch Japan. That's great. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, continuous plan uh, and uh, you know, so predicting some what could happen when China attacks uh, Taiwan. My question is, well, your continuous plans include uh, North Korean 
yeah. you know, say testing nuclear weapons, okay? Or uh, the coalition between three countries, uh, North Korea, China, Russia. As I, I, and I wonder whether you have a contingency plans for these ones. Thank you. I wonder the uh, uh, North Korea is a rogue, I'm sure. And uh, I think including the uh, collaboration with the South Korea, I think uh, that covers the definitely contingency, contingency plan about uh, North Korea. But uh, in terms of the, uh, to what extent we can predict about the North Korea? And uh, we like to discuss with you because you, South Korea knows. So, but our main focus is uh, uh, Taiwan uh, uh, contingency because of the uh, uh, long-term uh, analysis over the Kim Jong-un. I think uh, definitely we have to have another scenario about uh, Taiwan contingency. In addition to that, we have to be concerned about the, perhaps a change of the leadership of the, the United States. That might uh, uh, give the negative impact to the uh, trilateral uh, you know, alliance of uh, you know, your country, Japan, and the uh, US. It's, it's a really bit concerned. Yeah. Can I make one comment there? Uh, US military doctrine right now calls China the pacing challenge. And the language around that is that China is basically the only big challenge. Russia is an active challenge. These are interesting words. But that's really not true. I mean, the point about North Korea, Iran, we haven't even mentioned Iran and this unholy alliance among Iran, North Korea, China, Russia, is, is very concerning. And US policy doesn't have a broad enough lens. And that's why uh, South Korea and Japan are very important allies and very focused on, on their own protection, but also can enhance what the U.S. brings to the table. Let me get one, one more question here. We'll go in the, sorry, we'll go to the front row. We'll do two, two questions in, in sequence, and then we can have, have them wrap up front row and then there. Thank you. Um, please, please stand for the, the, the oh, cameras. Right. Okay. Uh, and which way should I look? <laughs> you can look anywhere. Uh, my name is Nonkuli Legonyembezi. I, I come from South Africa. Um, I'm just curious uh, to hear your views, particularly yours, uh, Janet. Um, if there was somebody on this panel from China, let's say a senior Chinese government official, and they were um, articulating what they think about when they hear the word or the term co competition, what do you think they might say? That's a great question. Then we'll do one more question here and then go down, go down the panel. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Barry. I'm a farmer from Brazil. And I would like to put the food question on the table. Uh. Um, uh, so we have North America and South America having water and land availability. And we have Africa negative. We have the Green Deal, which most probably is going to make Europe to need to import food. And we have China. I mean, if you talk about cooperation and, and if you talk about uh, feeding the world, I don't see how we cannot work together. And I I don't, know, I don't know how you look at it. Thank you. So t two great questions. Um, I will go, go, go down the line, um, start, starting with you, Maros, and you can address either one of those um, to wrap up. Please, we have about three minutes left, so I'll, I'll please be, quick. Yeah. I'll be telegraphic. I think uh, if it comes uh, uh, to the food question, of course, uh, we look at it also from the perspective of uh, food security in Europe. And uh, as you know, uh, we are a major food exporter. We would like to, to keep it in that way, but we would like to produce agriculture in much more sustainable way. So therefore, you have seen uh, quite a few uh, proposals in that regard. Uh, we are very proud that we have now the first uh, uh, in the world legally binding nature restoration law. We put a lot of focus on sustainability. And of course, we are ready to work with our partners, you know that our also negotiations on eventual free trade agreement also with, uh, with Brazil the negotiations take a long time because uh, the most difficult chapter is always is about uh, sustainability, agriculture and all these issues. But hopefully, eventually we can find a solution to that as well. Thank you. Talk, I'd love to hear your thoughts yes, on the I'd China like question. About the, to, 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 to talk about the China. Perhaps we, we can talk about the sustainability because a common interest. So if I were a Chinese representative, I like to talk about uh, you know, how to deal with the uh, um, disaster situation in, in that area because of high temperature, flood, and uh, water issue. We like to talk about the common interest first to, to order the cooperation. Matthias? We're not in the same industry, but we are totally aligned, it looks like, because exactly the same feedback to, to you. Excellent question. 
sustainability in our field energy transition, China is ahead in many uh, fields on electric vehicles, but they have a lot of uh, things to learn in terms of decarbonization of the supply chain and sustainability. So mm -hmm. fully aligned with that. Jane? Um, based on the comments of the Premier the other day, I would say they would embrace this term. And this is certainly a, uh, a you know, their, their, their language around a, attendance here, and they didn't attend the whole conference. They only attended, I think, part of it, uh, unfortunately, uh, was very positive. And I'm certainly hopeful that co co coopetition cool. becomes the relationship we all have with China. On, on the issue of sustainability, a couple of comments. I was in Costa Rica last week. And the, the Global South, I know that's not a good term, but anyway, let's just say Costa Rica has a lot to teach us uh, about sustainability. Uh, that, that country is in much better shape than many in the North, certainly including uh, the United States. And I heard the comments of some others in the Global South during this conference saying, uh, we don't want a handout. We want to demonstrate what we're capable of doing. And then we would like, in fact, we can probably help you and I, I think we still think of, the, of Africa and, and Latin America as afterthoughts. I was at a big dinner last night, and the African leader was called on last. And he said, this is typical. And that, you know, how embarrassing is that? Uh, and so why don't we just be a little more humble and imagine that these comments, first of all, that, that these problems are worldwide, and that coopetition uh, could be sent our way from the global south. That is a good note to end on. Thanks to all four of our panelists, and thanks to all of you. Thank you.